Um, so um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this panel, as you know, will focus on gender equality in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as the crisis unfolds, we are already witnessing the differential impact of it on women and girls. And to explore the issue in depth, we have invited a panel of experts on the topic. Uh, as you know, it's very difficult to summarize the long experience and expertise of our panelists in such a short time. And uh, I would encourage you to look at their bio that has been provided on the website. What I will do here is I will just introduce them by their current um, uh, professional status, and we will learn more um, about uh, their knowledge and experience as we go um, ahead with the panel. So we have uh, uh, Dr. Um, Devi Vijay, who is a professor in IIM Calcutta. She will be joining us soon. We have uh, Ms. Susanna Welford, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer and Founder at uh, Running Start USA. We have um, Dr. Alok, uh, we, watch, we have Dr. Ganesh MP, who is a professor at IIT Hyderabad. Uh, we have Mr. Alok Vashpe, who is Director at Population Fund India. And uh, we are also waiting for Ms. Shweta Shalini, who is Executive Director at Maharashtra Village Social Transformation Foundation India. And I hope um, they will join us soon. So we will start our panel with a very broad question. Um, the question is how COVID has affected uh, women's progress uh, towards equality. And um, as we uh, as we wait uh, for Professor Devi Vijay, I think we can uh, go ahead with uh, Ms. Uh, Susanna Belfort on her experiences of uh, uh, from the U.S. Uh, Susanna, would you like to share that with us? Yes, and and I just wanted to say a word that my um, my job is to train young women to run for political office and to see themselves as leaders. Um, because in the US, as in, of course, many countries around the world, women do not hold nearly as much power as men do. And so we're trying to to right the balance by training them from a young age to see themselves as leaders. Um, so COVID has been such a fascinating time um, in the US, if I can say that about such a, a negative um, occurrence. Um, it has absolutely impacted women um, really disproportionately. Um, and I, I like to think that there are, while there are many, many negative consequences, there are a few positive as well. And so I, I will just summarize and hopefully we'll get a chance to come back and, and talk about some of them in more depth. Um, everywhere in the world, women do more of the housework, more of the child work um, than men do. Um, and that's certainly true in the U.S. And while many women who have leadership positions and have, um, you know, play a role uh, bringing in money to their household, they have help. They have um, um, a nanny. They have daycare. They have somebody to watch over their children. Of course, nobody has that right now. And mm -hmm. and um, so the negative is that women are doing a huge amount of the child care. Um, and... The, my favorite article that I've seen during all of the, the pandemic was an article that said that when they polled American men and asked them how much of the homeschooling they were doing um, for their small children, men said that they were doing like over 60% of the uh, the homeschooling. They were doing you know a huge amount of it. But women said that men were doing only 3%. And I think that that's probably right, that, um, that, you know, this is not a role that men have traditionally had to do. And so doing any of it feels like it's a lot. Um, I, I had just a personal anecdote. Um, my cousin teaches law school um, at a, a big law, um, law school in um, right outside Washington, D.C. And she was teaching a class by Zoom the other day. And her five-year-old son came in and, and asked for something, you know, said, Mom, I, I, you need to make me lunch. And she very calmly said, Silas, I'm teaching a class right now. Mommy's working. And he turned to her and in front of her entire class of students said, Mom, I can't go to my dad and ask for help. Dad's doing his job. And I think that there is this this new world where you have both parents at home and it should be a time where parents are working equally. But um, I think that you know, if you look at studies in the U.S., that is definitely um, not what's happening. And just one note on the positive is that um, what I hope is going to happen um, in the the wake of COVID is I hope that because so many of us are working from home, men as well as women, 
that the home life is going to be more a part of work because I bet nobody who's listening to this call has, has not had the, um, the experience of having a child walk into the room or being interrupted by a dog or a loud noise. Like our homes are now part of our business. And I think that, um, at least it, when I was a, a, um, when I was working as a lawyer, I remember being so terrified that anybody on a call um, with my law firm would, would hear children in the background. And I think now perhaps we're getting to a time where we're normalizing the home. And um, so that, that would be something that would be a positive, um, a positive outcome of this COVID time. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah. We will go back yeah. to uh, to Professor Ganesh MP, and um, you would like to share your thoughts. Sure. So, in fact, I'm also going to talk about how uh, COVID through this phenomenon of working from home has changed a lot of things for both the genders. Mm-hmm. But we uh, understand that working from home is not a new phenomenon. In fact, it is there. Uh, you know, it used to be there, but earlier it used to be a choice which people had. But now we are forced to do it. Another uh, important aspect of working from home is if we, when we think about working from home, we think about only formal sector. In fact, there's a huge informal sector which works from home, especially women. Uh, industries like small scale industries like uh, uh, embroidery making or uh, uh, tailoring or uh, infant skip making. There are many such industries, either women work independently or uh, do work from uh, home, which is given to them by a small organization. Like, for example, manufacturing, where there'll be factories which give them those uh, jobs to them to work from home. So, all these industries are also affected badly by this COVID because of the lockdown. Uh, especially women, uh, for them, it is not just about uh, economic independence, but also it is their way of asserting uh, their role in the home as the uh, owner, the breadwinner. So that has been a serious blow uh, to this uh, group of informal sector women. In terms of formal sector, like Susan said, uh, there is a blur of uh, you know boundaries, uh, especially uh, uh, feminist economists call it uh, reproductive labor. You know, the, the, the burden of uh, doing household jobs and taking care of uh, children and elderly usually falls on women uh, because it is considered to be their uh, job. Gender, 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 uh, gender mm-hmm. So that that in fact has uh, you know has led to space and time constraints. Like Susan said, if a woman works, uh, it's not considered to be a work. I mean, you are the job is take care of. But uh, if men uh, do something, they, they cannot be disturbed because it is not their So there is always this problem of distribution of work, uh, distribution of uh, space and time, who owns the time to the space at home. For example, in a three-bedroom house, uh, if a woman wants to work and a man also uh, is, is working, who, who gets preference in terms of exclusive space? You know, So that is a very important uh, things like this, which may sound very small, but they make a huge difference. And access to private space or working space is always uh, favored for men in home, okay? So in terms of time also, how will I allocate my time? So space time is a very important uh, you know, factor. And I also like to introduce another, uh, or, or bring in another concept called intersectionality, especially women uh, who are poor or rural, they are more affected than women who are uh, at urban uh, or upper caste or upper class. So I'm not saying women are not affected, but these uh, you know damages increase depending on multiple identities which are underprivileged so it's it's a very complex phenomena we cannot you know at a single lens say that uh, you know women are affected or not affected or how they are affected it's, it's dynamic Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ganesh. Uh, I think uh, you, uh, you and Susana has uh, brought two very interesting angles to this conversation. One is, of course, who has access to space. So this whole uh, gender stereotype about work, and uh, and the second thing is the the role of um, uh, informal and formal sector. 
and uh, we have Alok who has a long expertise working on these issues. So we'll go back to Alok. Alok, would you like to share your experience on this topic? Sure, Bhavita. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, we have the evidence that shows that disease outbreak affects women and men differently. Pandemics exacerbate inequalities for girls and women who are also often the hardest hit. And we should not forget women play a massive role responding to crisis as caregivers at home, frontline healthcare and social workers, and as mobilizers in their communities thus exposing them to negative health consequences. We also know that the Indian women compared to men face many disadvantages along several dimensions, including education, child marriage, child labor and trafficking, economic stress, violence and mental health, which has been and will get further exacerbated due to COVID-19. Today, I would like to focus on concerns related to women's health mainly sexual and reproductive health, family planning, and violence against women, which affect their health. As in the past public health emergencies, uh, COVID-19 has diverted resources and attention from uh, routine health care services towards containing and responding to the outbreak. These reallocations contain constrain uh, already limited access to sexual and reproductive health services such as safe deliveries, contraceptives, and pre- and postnatal health care. When it comes to SRH or sexual and reproductive health, women already have very limited access to modern family planning methods. According to NFHS score, nearly 47% of Indian women do not use any contraceptives. There is high unmet need for family planning and burdened by sole responsibility of family planning. Many women resort to unsafe abortions. India reports 15.6 million abortions per year. Uh, restricted availability of sexual and reproductive health services during COVID-19 will contribute to a rise in maternal and newborn mortality, increased unmet for contraception, and increased number of unsafe abortions and sexually transmitted infections. Though the Ministry of Health and Family, Planner, uh, Family Welfare in Government of India included reproductive health and family planning as essential health services in its guidelines, the lockdown and other preventive measures restricted women's mobility and access to health services. The recent projections by UNFPA suggest that 47 million women in 114 low- and middle-income countries may not be able to access modern contraceptives and 7 million unintended pregnancies are expected to occur if the lockdown carries on for six months and there are major disruptions to health services. As per an analysis conducted by FRHSI, in the most likely case scenario, approximately 26 million couples in the country will be unable to access contraceptives from March to September before normalcy is restored. This assumption was made uh, uh, when the study was conducted. This is likely to result in an additional 2.38 million unintended pregnancies, 680,000 live births, 1.45 million abortions, and 1,750 maternal deaths approximately in the country. Finally, there are reports of increased intimate partner violence uh, post-COVID from across the world and from India too. According to UNFPA's recent projections, 31 million additional cases of gender-based violence can be expected to occur if the lockdown continues for at least six months. Violence against women remains a major threat to global public health and women's health during emergencies and need to be addressed with all seriousness. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um Thank you, Alokji, uh, for your um, for bringing uh, reproductive health and maternal uh, health into the discussion. Um, before we go further, would anybody like to comment or respond to any thoughts that come in, in your mind when you were uh, listening to, to to each other? Okay, uh, I would like to say a few words. Uh, like uh, Dr. Alok was mentioning. Uh, domestic violence, uh, there's a sharp increase in domestic violence. 
not necessarily physical violence but uh, you know other forms of violence like uh, you know uh, sh shouting at each other and you know those things have increased especially when there is no no avenues for you to uh, you know differentiate in work and uh, public 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 space and private space so i think that, that i have heard from many of my colleagues who are working in this area mm -hmm. unfortunately uh, these uh, uh, cases uh, remain unreported because women are uh, at home with the perpetrators and they are not able to go out to uh, make the uh, formal complaints mm -hmm. And I'm sure, can I just ask a question? I mean, I'm sure that this also applies to um, abuse of children too, um, right? It'd be the same thing. They're locked up together. And I'm sure that that has long-term damage potential as well, that if, you know, if there's an increase there and then they're not able to get the help that they need. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, COVID-19 has implications for children as well. Uh, we are uh, receiving reports uh, from states that uh, children are likely to get dropped from the schools. There are reports of child marriages also, and of course, domestic violence is there uh, against children. In fact, uh, post-COVID uh, uh, scenario, I think there will be increase in cases of uh, child labor as well as child trafficking. Um, can I can I ask? But is that because there's just less enforcement? People are not they're not looking right now, and and so um, there arises an opportunity. I think it has to do a lot with the uh, the loss of uh, jobs and livelihoods at mass uh. scale. Uh, people have gone back to their uh, villages. They have lost their livelihoods, and uh, this will lead to a lot of poverty and hunger. Sorry, we have been asked to mute our microphone because there was some um, clash uh, in the conversation. Um, I think uh, the, the conversation is going in the direction um, uh, of uh, the, the, the impact of COVID on informal sector and how it has affected uh, the livelihood of uh, livelihood, well-being of uh, women um, uh, in uh, uh, in. Uh, 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 um, a coping, the coping mechanism that has been um, there. So the question uh, that I have for the for the panelists uh, in general is: when we talk about informal sector, have you noticed the uh, any policy initiative or any um, any initiative by the uh, within informal sector to address these uh, challenges? I'm, I'm not very sure about uh, the policy changes which which are there to help these uh, women in the informal sector because that's why it is an informal sector. You know, it doesn't come under uh, the purview of uh, labor laws and things like that. But uh, maybe other mechanisms like many of these women they are also part of self help groups. You know, they belong to a, a group of women. They support each other and you know they financially and non financially. Probably through those mechanisms, uh, indirectly, their uh, you know their rights can be uh, ascertained. Especially there are uh, in, in states like Tamil Nadu, where I come from, there are women police stations where uh, exclusively problems related to domestic violence and uh, exploitation are addressed. So those kind of changes indirectly can make a difference. And in the States, I have not seen anything yet. I feel like in some ways it's too early to see um, real policy happening. But, um, you know, we, we've gotten money sent to most households that has helped and um, small businesses have been helped. But um, I, I think I always come back to the fact that our system right now, it, it's not a system designed to um, 
to help women live the best lives that they can, um, our system in America. And so my goal for the past 20 years has been to get more women into power um, in politics in America with the idea that there are so many changes that you can make to strengthen women's position in the workforce. Um, one of the reasons women are in such trouble right now um, around the world is our jobs, as I think that Ganesh said, our jobs are not valued as, as highly as men. We don't make as much money as men. Um, you know, if a child is sick, we're the ones who stay home with that child. And I, I really believe so firmly that if we have more of a balance of power, if we have more women um, leading alongside men and making policy alongside men, that we will end up with policies that will protect women more in crisis. And, you know, as in any crisis, you see the cracks in the system, you see the things that aren't working. Um, and I think that that goes everything from the economic problems. Um, but the, the things um, that, that you were just talking about, uh, domestic violence and child abuse, and, you know, unintended pregnancies, um, all of those things, I hope that the long-term solution will be that we'll get more of a, more women in power who are looking at those problems and, and can help fix them before they, before we get into a crisis like this. You are muted. Babita, you are muted. So yeah, one of the policy change that uh, Susan, Susanna, you have recommended is having more women in politics and having more uh, women and their say in policy making, um, uh, and that is uh, that is amazing. But there are there other, uh, uh, I, I, but one of the one of the issue that we are facing here is the gender uh, nature of care, and how uh, the, the, there is a. Um, uh, uh, about the, the the work that we that, that women do and how their work is undervalued so is there um so it it also means that not only policy change but also mental change uh, is is needed so uh, do you see any any uh, movement or any progress uh, towards that um, if I can just jump in, I, I think that in America, I am seeing some movement. Um, I, you know, as I said, I've been doing this work for 20 years. I've seen a long arc of, um, of women in, in political, um, and getting into politics. And, um, 2018 was a really tremendous year where we saw so many more women get into politics or get elected to politics in America. Um, and I think that you know, this happens a lot that when the systems are broken, when, when we are in times of trouble, you do see more women saying, I, I need to run for office. I need to, to see if I can help to fix this. So I think we're on a good trajectory. Um, 2018, we saw lots and lots of women running. And actually this year, um, there are, um, many more. So mm -hmm. I think that it is, things are going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And, and really, it's very interesting that you mentioned that because our uh, panelist uh, Shweta Shalini, who is a politician as well as a change, I think she can uh, comment more. So, Shweta, are you here with us? Could you hear us? I think the internet connectivity is an issue there. Um, uh, hi, Shweta, can you hear us? Hi, hi, Babita. I'm so sorry. I have very bad internet uh, connection here. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I didn't quite hear the question, though. I just couldn't hear the question. So the question we are uh, moving into. Uh, uh, so one of the, uh, the, the, the uh, policy suggestion proposed by Susanna is that we need more, more women in politics. So that we can change this whole idea about, you know, how, how about women's work and um, and how it is important and, and how issues related to women are important in general. And we thought we would hear from you because you are in that space. So it's. Yes, absolutely. I think, yes, I think I missed the first question where we were talking about uh, uh, and I almost heard a couple of opinions when uh, we were talking about how the pandemic is uh, uh, is a little tweaked towards women in, uh, inequality because um, uh, personally, I feel COVID has been a very good uh, equalizer 
but uh, we have to see it through the uh, through the lens lens of gender because at one point of time we realized that when we make policy policy cannot be gender agnostic uh, if you look at uh, india uh, uh, and uh, suzanne has been talking about uh, uh, household chores and so on and so forth let me talk about as basic as infrastructure now so access to water to most uh, uh, indian households is minimal so if you look at uh, access to water across india there are only 58% uh, uh, households which have access to water inside their households so women need to step out uh, to get water and uh, uh, who else in the house will actually step out and traditionally this is something that women have been doing now when they were wanted to step out there was a point of time when there were strict lockdown rules applicable and i remember and i would want to quote delhi high court which actually gave out a ruling saying that please allow women to step out for water and if they want to go to the police station to file a complaint against abuse because at one point of time people who made the policies did not keep in mind that uh, women needed a certain different kind of treatment and hence policy cannot be gender agnostic because somehow we need to ensure that women get an upper hand and can, we can specifically look at gender policies uh, and that will require people who are making the policies need to be women and that's uh, uh, the point that i would want to take forward from suzanne we still have 11% uh, uh, representation in our parliament for women and that's extremely low in in a in a country uh, which is uh, 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 you know as vast as india and as diverse as india we need more representation of women especially as policy makers now this i'm talking about the elected representation let's go to bureaucracy in bureaucracy which is actually where the laws are tabled we just about have about 32% uh, uh, women which is again low so primarily one of the focus and though uh, the women population i mean uh, the uh, the employment today is about 24% yet i think we are at par with brazil so we need to understand that in the employment sector in every sector so uh, for example one of the most affected sectors during these uh, covid times have been the frontline workers now frontline workers have had the maximum number of women support staff and uh, uh, please look at it nearly 80 85% of support staff are women and one of the worst affected today almost in every urban city of india we have nurses which is which comes as the frontal uh, uh, of the frontline um, support staff are uh, um, are on strike because they do not uh because a medical practitioner or doctor gets all the support from the policy but the nurses who's who's at the support uh, uh level do not get ppe kits do not get uh, uh, access to masks do not get access to medicines that the uh, practitioners have and so on and so forth so uh, all in all i would want to only conclude that until we have the right gender balance while making uh, uh the policies we will always have gender agnostic policies which is not the way that policy can be seen you have to make general neutral uh, policies but for being general neutral also you need to understand that why you need to neutralize you will have to give a little more access to the to the class to the to the section which is marginalized uh, in every sector and uh, perhaps uh, data has we have enough data to be proven uh, that the women sector is more uh, marginalized the women are more marginalized in almost every sector one last point that i will want to close at is unfortunately during these covid times we saw a uh, uh, a fatigue in donors uh, for almost every other uh, uh, you know problem that uh, we face and because uh, gender inequality was a problem that almost all not for profits and almost all organizations including the government were working at and is a long term problem 
unfortunately during covid times most of the donors focused on covid and most of the work that was happening around gender equality has stopped or has been stalled and it is unfortunate that the policy makers because again there are hardly any women sitting uh, at the position of power they are not being able to see that the long term effect is going to be a fact that we are wherever we had reached i think we would we would just get back to almost two third the steps 75% uh, regression we are going to see uh, in our efforts and policies that we have been seeing or doing so far thank you shweta you have given us to think about because um, you are very articulate in terms of explaining how how covid has affected differently to men and women and how the lockdown has um, how the lockdown which everybody has here mentioned that how it has led to domestic violence and uh, and the, the whole question of space and if women don't really have access to if women can, cannot really go out and and uh, have no sources of complaining on reporting what is happening at home there is uh, there is no way to feel safe and secure so you have raised this point in terms of policy i think there have been some question uh, from the audience uh, uh, related to uh, maternity leave in the us as well as um, how bad the impact has been uh, has been in, in the us but i would also like before i raise this question that has been um, that has been uh, raised by the audience i would also like to add um, if have you seen any policy that focus on care during this period of time uh because everything is coming up like the care responsibility and and other things so just an open question to any any of if any of you would like to take it so uh, can i answer babita yeah so i don't i'm not very sure about from a government's point of view but organizations especially uh, multinational companies which which are which have very good uh, gender sensitive policies they are trying to bring in some uh, policy changes which help uh, women who work from home not just women men also but men in terms of facilitating them to participate in this reproductive labor which is caregiving and uh, you know so one thing organizations are doing is Uh, especially in terms of space they are thinking in terms of uh, facilities like a cubicle or a capsule which can be used in a house uh, within the house which you can have exclusive space for you so especially if you are a woman and you don't have a space within the house to uh, sit for meetings or uh, conduct your uh, lectures and things like that they get uh, facilities which help you have this exclusive space something like a cubicle or or a cap- capsule so th- people have been thinking about these lines but uh, beyond a certain point it's it's all about uh, attitude change which is which uh, i don't know which comes through sensitization and societal change yeah yes shweta please go ahead so uh yes uh, so i would want to so the specific question is around care i think uh, there are two things that uh, we need to understand i have spoken about caregivers in a formal sector of uh, uh, frontline um, you know workers so i'm not going to touch upon that but uh, there are two things which is very important and i'm going to talk again with the indian context in mind one of the most biggest uh, apart from the covid crisis we saw was the crisis of the uh, um, the uh, labors and uh, one of the things that we saw uh, especially in the migratory labors is because migration is uh, an urbanization is something that we've seen in india for years together in uh, in a couple of days or couple of weeks the entire lot of this migratory labors actually went back to their own home so care with respect to home because not a lot of people actually had shelters uh, uh we we saw uh, the government come up with various policies around shelter homes which could give them uh, uh houses uh, as far as food is concerned 
because most of these people lost their jobs because they were they were uh, migratory laborers and uh, because of total lockdown had nothing uh, in into their hands no savings nothing that was another policy and very quick intervention that we saw from the government uh, and a lot of not for profits actually stepped up uh, one of the things across the globe and not only in india but across the globe that we did not see and i have personally looked into it are pregnant women uh, suffering uh, because of covid uh, uh, because of total lockdown sometimes most of the important tests that had to be done during pregnancy were not being available second and the most important thing was uh, we hardly had data even for the most progressed uh, 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 cities like new york we hardly have data of how malnutrition and uh, uh, you know uh, sam and mam are actually affecting covid so uh, across india we have been trying to figure out if uh, severe acute malnutrition cases uh, quickly turn data supporting it so we we need to also understand that this is where we need a care intervention almost immediately because pregnant women and children who are severely acute malnutrition or uh, moderately acute uh, malnutrition is going to have need a policy intervention as far as uh, uh, covid is concerned uh, and uh, by terms of uh, uh, logic they will be prone to covid a lot more but unfortunately uh, across the globe we've hardly seen any policies or interventions uh, around uh, this space uh, last but not the least i think one of the most important things especially uh, in india uh, is uh, access to digital um uh, unfortunately urban india we still have access to digi digital but uh, across rural india which is the spans of about 70 odd percent we still see women using digital devices of their men so it is the men folk that actually own the digital devices so whether you talk about smartphones or the internet devices and so on and so forth so because there are hardly any uh, access to digital uh uh access to any sort of reaching out option uh, has been minimized so unfortunately that is another intervention that government has not been able to do uh, as far as care is concerned because i can't reach out to people who actually need care so that is again a very global phenomena because if there is no access to digital today in a in a space which is uh, uh, um, you know locked down uh i i don't see uh, how we can actually see we are across the globe but we are reaching out to each other because we are virtually connected but if you're not if you do not have access to internet there's no way that you can actually reach out to people so uh uh i uh, during the lockdown especially the not for profit and the ngos could not step up uh and because they did not get support uh, uh, especially for gender inequality uh, i think that this was a phenomena that we actually uh, saw a lot so yes in terms of uh, caregiving uh, the interventions have been i i would rate it at uh, 3 on 10 thank you so much um uh, shweta and um, and and ganesh um just uh, we are almost uh, at the you know we only have 7 minutes left uh, one of the question that is um, that is uh, coming up here again in formal sector uh, in when we are talking about formal sector organization what if um, what if working from home become a normal a new normal how would how are we going to cope with that um and that is the question for uh, for uh, for our experts here uh, but another question is what would have what would be how would we solve the negative consequences of of um of covid in informal sector so these are the two question and, and i'll i'll leave you whoever want to go ahead um so formal sector what would happen if working from home become normalized that's the first question I'll just jump in and say um you know I, I had twin boys when I was um working at a law firm in a really busy job and it was difficult to commute to my job and I had to travel um if we have the option to work from home if we can talk to people in 
in India and the US and Australia um, and don't have to get on airplanes, I actually think it will be tremendously helpful for hopefully for, for both parents. Um, so I, I think that that, um, that is, that is a big plus. And I know we've had some technology challenges, um, on the call today. And I actually think that's going to be another thing that hopefully will be a real bonus is that we will have systems, um, you know, virtual systems like this that work so beautifully and make it really seamless to be able to connect. Okay. Um, one, uh, I, I don't think it will become a new normal, even though I gave this question, I don't think it will become a new normal uh, after COVID is gone, but we don't know whether when or when COVID will be gone. Okay. So assuming it is gone, I don't think it will become a new normal because initially organizations were very happy that uh, it, 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 it helps in cutting down costs, but it is not. Okay. But it will increase. Uh, if it increases, then working from home as an option will increase. If it increases, it can have both advantage and disadvantage for women. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned this uh, concept called intersectionality. Certain class and uh, caste of women may benefit and certain women may not benefit. For example, women uh, who are from rural areas who come to cities, young graduates who come to cities to work uh, in uh, IT sector or ITS sector, they may, if they have to work from home, they may have to go back to their villages or go back to their entire two cities. So that will, in fact, curb their freedom and you know their right uh, to access to many of these resources, which only urban places can offer. So that that can happen. Another important thing is uh, we see a lot of these research about uh, missing women in workforce, not just in India. Throughout the globe, there are studies which say that uh, num women participation in formal and informal sector are coming down. Probably if uh, working from home becomes new normal, women from disadvantaged groups, their contribution will further reduce in the workforce. Well, uh, I would like to say that COVID is going, uh, COVID is going to stay there for quite some time. So uh, we will have to learn to work from uh, not only from home, but uh, from everywhere, actually, to be uh, frank, uh, because uh, there are going to be restrictions on travel uh, also for quite some, uh, some time. So uh, for NGOs, especially who deliver services in the field, it's not going to be normal uh, so soon. Uh, so those are the challenges we are still trying to figure out. But uh, uh, what uh, I want to uh, say is that uh, uh, given the evidence, we must apply an intentional gender lens when we design programs to address the socioeconomic health impact of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 should not be seen as a standalone disaster impacting the world. And we should prepare ourselves with adequate knowledge, gender disaggregated data and uh, evidence. And finally, I think we have to rebuild our health systems to ensure uh, that uh, they meet the needs and realities of all, including in times of crisis. This includes prioritizing and funding primary health care and universal health coverage grounded in gender inequality and human rights. All I would want to sum up and say that I think the new normal, the space for women is large because uh, uh, corporates have, especially in the formal sector, I think corporates have started realizing that work from home is a good option. And that bridges the gap for uh, talented women sitting at home to not only comply, but also contribute. I think it will also bridge the gaps with uh, women around disabilities who cannot travel or are immobile. So uh, that's one option. As far as the informal sector goes, uh, data supports us that uh, COVID is affecting more men than women. Uh, I don't know the reason why, but I think their immunities are larger. And second, because uh, my personal favorite uh, to this thought process is because of the makeup that women put. I think they are they are used to not touching their faces uh, time and again. So whatever may be the reason, I think the fact is that uh, 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 informal sector is going to consider that women are going to be less affected and they are more sanitized and more safe and secure, especially in India. So we will see uh, 
you know and i'm generally a optimist so i am going to see a and say a thumbs up for the new normal and women in the new normal so let's keep uh, uh, and close the statement at saying that yes all we need to do is to pay attention uh, uh, the opportunities are right there the light at the end of the tunnel is bright and it's there for us to stay Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shweta. And thank you, Ganesh. Thank you, Aloki. And thank you, Susanna. I don't think I can add anything else to that, what you have said. I think that's the perfect way of ending it. So we are almost there. Thank you so much. And, and I, I learned a lot. And I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did. So thank you. Hope I have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.